Hello and welcome back to the Injury to Lead podcast with your host, me, Dr. David Meyer, dream coach and performance physical therapist. Today we have Dr. Rob Lynn join the show. Rob and I graduated from NYU's Doctor of Physical Therapy program one year apart eight years ago. While Dr. Lynn was studying to become a physical therapist, he simultaneously competed as a three-time champion in semi-professional Muay Thai fighting. After graduating, he continued to compete while also progressing his sports performance journey with the United States Olympic Committee, serving as a volunteer sports physical therapist in Colorado Springs. In his last fight back in 2017, he sustained a severe forearm fracture that made him question everything. Without further ado, here's Dr. Lin's journey of going from injured to elite. Rob, it's been a while since we've talked, man. It's been, it's been what? Seven, eight years since NYU. Great to have you here, man. Been really good, man. A crazy journey. Here I am. Here we are during these crazy times. And it's always good to connect with uh, fellow alumni because when I see everybody doing big things, it's super inspiring. And I uh, appreciate you having me and talking to me because I, I've seen all the things that you've done. And I'm like, damn, we're coming from the same roots. And that's good to see. No, I appreciate that, man. And, you know, it's kind of crazy. So we've both done like a reverse relocation. I was out in Los Angeles and my fiance and I I came back just this year to New York. And of course we studied at NYU together and you're from SF and up North in Northern California. And you just went back to California, what, a few years ago? Hey, um, I spent, you know, after I graduated, I was supposed to move back, but New York city was just holding me there. Um, really I was like getting real deep into the whole Muay Thai scene. So that's really kind of why I stayed. Um, and you know, finally took, you know, I knew I was going to come back eventually and, uh, circumstances led to me finally moving to Oakland, you know, getting a, a job here and being closer to family. So, you know, it's crazy how things work out and I believe things work out for a reason. So that's why we're out here and it's kind of a funny switch, right? Absolutely, Rob. Yeah. So we went to NYU together. You were a year ahead of me. I graduated in 2012. You graduated in 2011. I didn't even know that you were getting deep into the Muay Thai during your days at NYU. Yeah. Kind of crazy. It wasn't expected at all. And so, I mean, if I go back to, you know, even before going to New York, I, I had basically it all started talking about injured to elite. It all started with an injury. <laughs> it all started with me being a varsity basketball player. That was my dream. I wanted to be the Jeremy Lin. I wanted to be Rob Lin in the NBA. Funny thing, that didn't pan out. I basically had an injury, fractured my fibula in a summer league. Um, you know, my senior year when I thought it was going to start and everything is, you know, I was one, two, three. They, they even had me a small four. We ran a three guard offense. And, uh, you know, that put things on hold. So my mom put me in karate and I was like, karate, you know, she's like, no, you need to get off your butt. You need to do something. My brother was doing it. And then that was the first time I really like trained properly, you know, besides the little school, little fist fight. And I was like, oh my God, I should have done this way sooner. And from that, it got, you know, from that injury, basically it put me on a roller coaster of, uh, of martial arts. And I, I did Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and um, Muay Thai, Sancho. So I had two exhibition fights before I even moved to New York. And, you know, those are, those are the, your first couple of fights. You're kind of like, oh my God, this is what fighting is like. You know, that's when you decide really if you want to do this. And my skinny, but, you know, at the time I weighed a lot because I put on weight because I was a skinny guy that wanted to lift. And I'm sure everyone did that in college. Right. So my first fight, I fought about 25 pounds heavier than I was fighting by the time I was a champion. <laughs> so guys, you can imagine how big those dudes were. So I got my butt kicked, you know, common theme, you know, and, uh, you know, went to New York and went to NYU. Uh, didn't think I was going to train anymore or, or fight anymore. I just wanted to train. And so, that's kind of how it started. And so during your days at NYU, I mean, I could tell you for me, studying was a challenge. I was never a great student. Everybody's so surprised about that, but there was a lot of time committed to getting our doctorate. I mean, it was no joke, right? We had to take histology and all those other crazy classes, not even that related to the orthopedic or the sports performance side that you and I have gotten so far into. So how did you balance all that out? A doctor or physical therapy student and, and training as a fighter? 
moving to New York from Cali, first of all, was a huge culture shock. And sure. when I type, you know, when I looked up a Muay Thai gym, you know, I found a place that was kind of like a second home, you know, I've never had that kind of like a, a feeling at a gym until that time. And, Cause I was training other gyms, but it wasn't like home. And so Phil Nurse, uh, he, you know, he was a renowned Muay Thai trainer in New York City. I, I just happened to fall into his gym and I was like, you know what? It was my escape from the stress of, of school and all that. I could just not think about, not think about physical therapy, not think about grades. I would go in there, sit on the couch, you know, study if I had an exam and then, you know, train for an uh, hour and a half, uh, hour and a half, you know, hop in the shower, go home. And that was my routine. So. Wow. It gave you that outlet that, that we all needed. Of course, a lot of our outlet during PT school was every time we took a test, we'd all go out and hit the town and have fun and party and, you know, study hard, party hard, right? We definitely did in PT school, but we're all sports guys and girls in physical therapy school for the most part. I don't want to downplay any other areas, pediatrics and neuro and all that stuff, which is very important. But I mean, we, we killed it in flag football. We killed it in the intramurals, you know, and then I did some judo with my roommate, Brian Basel. I mean, that was just a little introduction to it. To take it to the level that you took it to, so you're, when was your first fight? The ones that I did before NYU were smokers and they don't go on your record. It's a way for up and comers to get experience. Um, so my first amateur fight was the summer after our first year. At, <laughs> it's funny. I took that fight during clin my first clinicals. So I was doing my round of clinicals at uh, Manhattan Hospital up in, uptown, you know, East, East Harlem almost. And I was training for that fight. Uh, it was a fight in New New Brunswick, New Jersey, and uh, that's when I had my first amateur. And so, kind of happened as I was like doing my clinicals, had the fight, you know. Then I was on summer break. So, what were your day? How long were your days? So you were training, so you were working with patients, and then going to the gym. Man, and my CI knew I was doing it. She had kind of, she kind of was into it, so it didn't you know it didn't affect my clinical. I was so blessed, you know. You know, people might take that the wrong way. Like, why are you coming in here looking all crazy, <laughs> losing weight? <laughs> what are you doing? Clinical? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, and that's that's one thing we probably should talk about a little bit. I mean, the mindset uh, as a fighter. How how easy is it to kind of shift gears from training for these fights and then going in and working with your patient who is suffering from an injury where you're getting, you know, going through the, the trauma of everyday training and sparring and all that? I feel like a lot of the times, you know, they would find out that I was training and I think people really saw saw that I understood what they were going through you know, because I was doing it day in and day out myself. And especially in a sport where the whole objective is to hurt the other person, you know, it was kind of a weird balance, almost like an oxymoron that I was trying to heal this person and do the opposite to someone else. But they lent themselves to each other. Um, I really understood what it took to be an athlete who has to kind of continue to train under certain circumstances, right? Different styles of PTs, you know, some are more conservative, some aren't. And I kind of understand what it takes to be a, a athlete at that kind of level. So even the people that weren't competing, um, I think they saw it as, oh, he's fit. You know, he knows the human body. So it kind of helped out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I totally hear what you're saying because I get the common question from a patient who has, let's say, an ACL reconstruction. Dave, have you had, have you had an ACL reconstruction? Have you had injury before, a surgery? And I have to give them that look and say, no, I didn't. You know, just like Professor Weaver said, you know, give a confident no. And I gave that confident nope, didn't have it. And I don't want to have that conversation and jinx myself. <laughs> I think there is a lot to be said about getting beaten up <laughs> and and being able to relate to your patients through the aches and the pains and, and be a, a role model to some degree with them. You know my record. It's not a perfect record. Um, I were, there were times where I win like three, four straight, then I would like lose a bunch straight. Right. I never really turned down a fight. It was a roller coaster, and my patients saw that. Right. Um, it was it, it's it's a whole mental aspect behind it because I had to be able to pick myself up 
um, be, even though I'm down in the dumps with a split eye open, you know, lightweight concussion and hold myself together and still treat the patient. Um, it was, it was a tough, it was tough. I'll be honest. It, it wasn't easy. But you got through it. You graduated from NYU with a doctorate. You kept on winning some fights during PT school. And what was, what was it like after graduation? What were your next steps? So I graduated, you know, I had maybe like four or five fights and, you know, as an amateur fighter, you know, that's kind of like a, I used to think that was a lot, but you know, that's like a, you know, people do some fights here and there. Um, so I continued to train and I did home health. First of all, uh, I wanted to make some money to pay the debt that we're in. You know, people don't realize that when they go to PT school, we're doctors in a lot of debt um, and not making that much. I took that home health job as because it paid a little more than others. And I was going from <laughs> apartment to apartment, not knowing what's behind the door project to project sometimes homeless shelters i didn't know and it was great man because i don't know i feel like i'm 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 able to relate to a lot of people there i don't know i guess they didn't see me as like crazy or threatening to them and they they like like me in their home made me food sometimes <laughs> i got into uh orthopedics also because you know that was my thing you know like me and you you know we're, we're into sports like ultimately that's all i want to do and so i I've got a job with uh, Scott Weiss at Body Zone, and it fortunately, as a fighter, he was very like-minded. He used to box. He's from Brooklyn, and he even wrote a book called uh, Confusing the Enemy about Customato, who's Mike Tyson's famous trainer. Customato, like Mike Tyson, holds Cust dearly into you know his all of his success. I mean, that guy was an absolute boxing legend. He wrote a textbook like this big, interviewed Mike Tyson, got a lot of uh, facts straight and talked about, you know, his whole training, even with Floyd Patterson and, and all the heavyweights, how he would train them and, you know, his his whole ideology. So it was crazy. I think that's the universe coming together. Work with Scott. He was he was cool with me, you know, being a fighter. So, hey, I just kept on training. And it started to get more and more serious, you know, like um, as, as an amateur in Muay Thai, you know, the more fights you have, you start, you stop wearing gear, you don't wear headgear, you start doing semi-professional roles, you start throwing elbows to the face, you know, you're, fight, you're starting to take bigger fights. Um, and eventually it went from one thing to another. Eventually I became a main event fighter, which was kind of crazy. It's like, man. I got to sit around and watch 20 people fight and then have them be like the main event. Like that's the most nerve wracking thing. And uh, that started to be a common thing. Then they start giving you a title shot and it took me a long time. You know, as an amateur, there's guys that I see that like get a title shot after like four or five fights, which is cool. They're probably good. It took me, I think like 13 or 14 fights to, to finally get one. But you know, I, it felt like I, when I finally got it, I really earned it. And when I got it, I got my belt that first time, and I, and uh, it, it meant so much more to me, man. And uh, it took a whole mindset change to even like believe that I could do it. Like I didn't even do Muay Thai to get a title, you know. Like I'm the skinniest dude in high school over here, like getting bullied on half the time, or you know. So few questions. So first off, why Muay Thai? Why? How did you get into Muay Thai versus the other? You said you, said you did Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but Muay Thai stuck to you a little more you know um i love i love doing that too you know i have a funny story about that also but uh i think i just like hitting things <laughs> rather than wrestling you know it just worked out for me i just like hitting things see the drum set in the background that's why i have a drum set man i like to hit baseballs hit the drums i just i was a gross motor type of kid i was always climbing things i wasn't the fine motor i wasn't sitting there painting or anything like that i'm creative but I, I was just more into the big gross motors i loved working out and you know the big you know the big for the big core lifts and things like that so i i feel you on 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 that element um and then so take me to that that winning fight where you you got the belt where where was that when was that yeah man it was on a show called the warriors cup which is like a um, one of the big shows on the east coast uh the promoters chris tran like the friendliest promoter everybody loves him in the game and it's funny because my first amateur fight was on his show and it came full circle that i was getting a title shot um he eventually blew up he had like some of the world's most uh 
professional champions on that show from like all over the place. So it became a big show. And um, I got matched up with the guy uh, named Sturgos. He, his nickname was the Greek Dynamite. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, he's now a professional fighter, like with tons of fights fighting like the top guys, you know. And uh, we got matched up. It was a five round fight. Muay Thai, professionally, you fight five rounds. Amateurs are three rounds. Um, so when you fight for a title, they'll make it, you know, five round professional kind of thing. And so that was like my second five round fight. And, um, you know, I'm not the biggest dude. I kind of grind guys down, you know, that was kind of my style, like break them down, clinch them, elbow, knees. And good endurance. Yeah. When I see that they, when I'm going like this and I see them, that's when I'm like, all right, it's my time. So five round fights actually were my better things because three round fights were so fast. Like a guy's going to try to knock you out in the first five seconds. So they're wild, you know? Right. So you were saying this was, this was essentially a professional level fight. You know, you didn't get paid for it. So I wouldn't call it that I was amateur, but uh, you know, the rules were much the same five rounds. Um, time was a little less, but. You know, you're fighting the best guy your way, you know, so. Pretty much. I mean, this is the high, this is just about the highest level of Muay Thai fighting in the area. I talk to professional fighters about this. And I always say like, oh, uh, people come up to me, how many fights you got? You know, 20 something, you know, whatever fights, but they're just amateur. I always tell them like, I'm an amateur fighter. And I've, I've heard professional professionals uh, say like, the only difference is I get paid, you know, because at the end of the day, like there's guys that never even had an amateur career and just hop in there and, you know, make money. But just being technical, I don't want to make people, uh, you know, not, you know, you know how it is. I'm not, I'm not a pro, but, but gotcha. Yeah. So fighting at a high amateur level, that's what it was. But nothing can take away from what you did, especially while you're a doctor of physical therapy. I don't know many people that, that did that. We spoke a little bit about that. Are there any other physical therapists out there that are also semi-professional fighters? That's a good question. I I mean, I, I've known guys that may have had like one or two, maybe like just train a little bit, um, but not really, you know, not that I've known because in the fight game, people are got completely different professions, man. And then some of the guys come up like, dude, you're a doctor. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm like, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I'm over here like <laughs> doing some crazy stuff. And uh, could- even guys I fought before I even fought them, they hit me up like, hey, can you show me some exercises? And then boom, we're matched up fighting. You know what I mean? It's kind of funny. That is funny. Yeah. At least, you know, I'm sure people would say, yeah, well, you could fix yourself after you get all messed up. Yeah, no, not really, man. I, I feel like that's kind of my niche. And I, I ended up defending my title three times and I'm fighting under Phil Nurse. Like everybody knows Phil. So I feel like this is, that's kind of been like my thing is being like the fighters PT. I just haven't really like put myself out there like that in that sense. Cause I've always tried to separate the two, you know, like it was always like, I would go to the gym and like, people would ask me for questions. I'm like, I'm here to train for a fight. I'm not here right now for anything else right now. And uh, being a fighter, you got to kind of be selfish. And that's every fighter will tell you that it's any athlete, you know, you're here to take care of yourself. And that was the hard part about it too. That was that was really tough to kind of balance. So I had to separate the two. That's a big that's a big point that you just made, Rob, in terms of athletes being able to flip the switch on and off. And then they get a bad rep because they can appear to be an asshole or have a big ego. And the truth is when you're performing, you need that veil. You need to be somewhat invincible, especially as a fighter. You can't go in there scared, right? You can't win playing defense. And athletes, the same thing. When they're going up in the batter's box and they're facing a power pitcher throwing in the upper 90s with movement, you better be confident. And so I think people misinterpret that confidence sometimes as not being a good person, which is couldn't be the further thing from the truth because athletes are are people that want to achieve and they they want to... They, they want to uh, achieve their dream, really. And, you know, your your example, your story here is the epitome of that because you're not getting paid for it. You're grinding it out. You're working as a physical therapist. And you're trying to, in some ways, balance all those different lives out. Um, you know, I talk about this in the book I wrote, Injured to Elite. And I use this example about a boxer or a fighter going into the ring. And... I talk about building their performance team. So having all their people behind them. 
And I use the example, imagine if you had a fighter coming into the ring and behind them, there was 80 people that were coming in there. We always see those fights where they have so many people, so many people in their entourage. And I'm always like, is less more in terms of the people, like you had Phil Nurse on your side. Like, how do you determine who's there? First of all, you're a physical therapist yourself, but how do you determine who's the, the people that are guiding you and being a part of your team? That's a great question. That is a great question. You watch these guys, these fighters come out with their entourage, with their rappers, <laughs> everybody. Um, so, you know, Phil's a head trainer. You know, I, I always love to have him in my corner. He, you know, if he was there, that was like, you know, my corner guy, you know, you always got the second corner man too. And usually it was Susan. Susan Reno is, first of all, Susan's like the big sister I never had. She was one of the pioneers in pro boxing. She's a female pro boxer, and she was the first woman to do uh, the sa same amount of rounds and time as men. So she kind of made it so that it was equal playing field. So, so she was kind of like always the second person in my corner, and she wrapped my hands. Like she wrapped my hands so good that like other trainers would come over and watch her wrap them. And when I put those wraps on, it was just like, oh, dude. Like I always just remember being like, all right, it's time. It's time, you know? So, yeah, I know the feeling there, especially for a ball player coming into the training room to get whatever they need right before the field. That that makes all the difference. You you feel good, you look good, you play good, right? You get paid good. So you need all that. You need to feel good. You need to feel like you're ready to go out there. That's such a huge part. And that's why I think a lot of the training styles, when you put it down to the science, like you and I were doctors of physical therapy and we'll tell you, well, the researcher, you know, it doesn't support that Olympic style lifting or whatever it is. But then what it does support is, well, you're getting that heart rate going and you're getting the emotions going. And there is nothing you can say about that. Getting into that mindset to go out there and perform. It doesn't matter what you're doing, whether there's research behind it or not. If you're in the right headspace, that's when that's when winning happens. You know, you got a great point, man. And and you you know you've done a lot of work with that mindset aspect, the mental aspect, sports psychology, and that was the biggest difference between me just being you know an average you know fighter to me deciding that I need to take this more seriously. And um, I had to change the way I thought, you know, because I was at I was always putting myself down. You know, I do. I think a lot of people do that in their heads. I would have these negative thoughts, question myself right before a fight. That's the, like the one time you don't want to question yourself. People talk trash about like Floyd Mayweather talking about it, you know, talking all cocky. You know, I'm the best in the world, which he, you know, he really is. But if you're not thinking like that, if there's other people thinking the opposite and you're doing yourself a disservice, not really being confident. Like I need to go in there with a game plan mentally and physically. So, Yeah, absolutely, Rob. And then aff affirmation. I mean, John Denny and I on this podcast talk a lot about affirmation statements. And that's what F Floyd's doing, right? Affirming, I am the champion or, you know, yeah. all the fighters, Sugar Ray Leonard or... Uh, Conor McGregor, you know, he's, he's one of the most notorious about it. You know, you say it, you're going to do it. If I don't believe I'm, I'm the best physical therapist, you know, walking out this door... How, how is someone else going to believe I am? Yeah, that, that's so true. And, and I think people sometimes get a little confused between being cocky and being arrogant and affirming your vision. Oh, for sure, man. That's like a hard line to, to walk, man. I think, I think the best way to kind of, in my opinion, to navigate that is, you know, you have to be your best advocate, first of all. Right. And, and secondly, you know, to counterbalance that, you just have to be grateful and humble at the same time, which sounds crazy, but I'm always trying to remember to give thanks to what made me this way and what, what's given it to me, you know? Like, this moment of glory isn't going to last. And there, you know, Never done. <laughs> ups and downs, it's, I, I have to take that into account. And what I can trust is that the people that help me get there will hopefully still be there and you know, if they put that much into me, I can at least be grateful that I have people around me like that. That's 
I, Rob, I think that's where the, you know, we talk about the mind, body, spirit, the Trinity, the holistic approach that, that I've adopted recently. And so many great clinicians have that I'm learning more and more from every day and trying to surround myself by, but that Trinity of the, 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 the mind, body, and spirit, the spirit speaks. And when your spirit is that of somebody like Ali, say what you want about a guy like Ali, right? I mean, you can see it in them. Yes, they're shit talking. That's part of their game. But you see in their spirit, I mean, look at video of Ali when he was much older at the, the later stages of his life. And you see it. He's still there. He's still in the room. And he, there's a passion about it that he has. And not just a passion about it. That's a disservice to use that, the, that phrase. But there's a love of it that you could see in him that he embodies. And you know, even in you, you'll never just be a physical therapist or a fighter. You're Rob Lynn. You're all of those things. And it's your, it's, you bring that into your care of your patients. You bring that into the lives of the people that you, you, you know, you spend your life with. And that's what I'm trying to work on now. I'm trying to break down that barrier. Forget about the title, physical therapist. Yes, we got our doctorate from, from NYU. We have a state license in California, New York, but above that, we're people that want to inspire others to do their thing and guide them on their journey. I, you know, we're all blessed with different situations and different stories, and I think we have to use that to our best ability. You know, you had your baseball experience, and man, Major League Baseball, that's so crazy that you were able to work at that kind of level with athletes of that elite status that you know, you have so much knowledge and you can really help people in different kinds of ways. You've seen people making the big bucks with the most pressure yeah. and, you, and you know what kind of, you know, that, you know what people need to, to really succeed or to get out of uh, a major like slump. Right. And, and the thing that stands out to me is they breathe the same, uh, the same air that you and I breathe. They have the same natural ingredients. Yeah, is their DNA maybe a little different than us? And do they have certain traits that give them a favor? Sure, a little bit. But what I learned by being around these insanely good athletes from different areas was that, man, they're not that different. They're not that different. They, You can tap into that mindset, like you were saying, and that is half the battle or whatever percentage, I can't give you a percentage. It's a big percentage. Let's just say that. So the Yogi Berra phrase, baseball's 90% mental, the other half is physical or something along those lines. I mean, you can put a number to it, but it is, it is so important to embody the mind and the spirit of, of that elite athlete that you want to be. Um, so yeah. Rob, in, in 2017, I know you mentioned that was kind of a tough year for you. You mind sharing some of that? Yeah, man. Uh, wow, 2017 was a year of some big changes. Um, you know, that was one of my, that was my last year in New York. I knew I was dating a girl at the time. And, uh, you know, the plan was to move back to Cali. You know, she really wanted to be close to family. And uh, the plan was to, you know, start one, you know, get married and start one. And, uh, you know, things were crazy at that time. I was in a crazy mindset. I'm like, but I'm just getting this Muay Thai thing finally, like, going. I'm thir at the time. I think I was like 32 or 33 or something. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm considered, I might be considered a little old to be doing Muay Thai at that point. And I was thinking, like, shoot, I need to get it all in while I can. You know, that year. Uh, <laughs> and so I think I took a. So that year was just crazy I, I i i had done a tournament i lost the fight by split decision which was like a tough one because even the guy i beat told me he thought i, I won and uh everybody was telling me that too i was like all right i'll bite that bullet i don't care then i actually was deciding like should i just go professionally and uh you know make it my last run at it and so that's what i kind of did and so i this is funny I actually quit my job as a PT. Wow. Um, yeah, I quit. I told I told Scott and Costa, the bosses, I'm like, hey, guys, you know, you guys know I'm a fighter. I don't got that much time left. This is my timeline. Um, I was like, I need to go to Thailand and train and actually fight professionally. I need to do this. 
you know, it was like, they were like, whoa, what the hell? And then I'm like, like, you guys can either give me like this much vacation time to do it, or I'm going to do it. You know, they're like, well, we're, they're like, well, we respect that you're going to do it. Like, we can't guarantee your job's going to be here. I'm like, well, I got to do this for me. So I booked the flight to Thailand. Um, girlfriend at the time wasn't very pleased. <laughs> yeah. Um, spent a month out there, you know, booked a fight. Circumstances happened. I got really, really sick, like bad, where they had to pull me out of the fight. And I was like, dude, I just quit my job, basically almost threw away relationship and all this for this. And I was just like, oh my God, why am I here? You know, you know, I'm, I'm, things happen for a reason, right? Right. Fly back. Um, I got great training, man. Met some great, great people. It was kind of like something that I actually needed to do regardless if I was going to fight or not. So you were in Thailand, you missed the fight, you did some training, you come back to the States, you come back to New York? Come back to New York and it's like, time time to move. Uh, my trainer just goes, hey, you know, I know you're moving in like a, a month or whatever. He's like, but I can get you one more fight, you know? You can get that belt back if you want. And uh, I was like, you know, <laughs> look over my girlfriend like, <laughs> Like, hey, you know, I know we're moving. She's like, what? Like, you know, we're supposed to move. We're supposed to do all this. And and you're supposed, you know, like a week before, like, is that the surprise? You know, like, this is my last hurrah. Like, this will be my last one. We're going back. I don't know what life's going to be like. I was like, screw it. I took it. I fought a really good dude. Like, this guy was knocking people out, everything. And uh, he fought a bunch of guys at our gym. You know, he's a cool dude. Like, actually, you know, we're. We, we, were, we had drinks before, like, you know, like a month before that. And then he was, I didn't even know I was fighting. He texted me, like, hey, hey we're, we're fighting. <laughs> like, All right, let's do it, you know. Um, and so that's what happened. And during that fight, uh, it was going well. You know, I was ready for it. I was like, told everyone came out to that fight. You know, it was my last hurrah. I was getting burnt out, you know, of Muay Thai, actually, at that point. So I'm like, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it big, you know. And it went big in a different way by the Mets. Dude, I fought there so many times. I would get off, see uh, the old Shea Stadium. Hey, Queens Queens holds a special place in my heart because I, I like live there. I really like Queens. I love the people I meet from out there. I love all of New York. But... Queens is a, a special place. It's one of the most diverse places in the world. What do they call it? The world's city? The world's borough? Yeah, man. Like 20 different languages on the seven train, you know? <laughs> so you're in this fight. and Yeah going okay round one was like i'm so hyped up like if i have a little clip like you can hear people like yelling i like turn around i can't even focus i'm like looking at my friends like yeah come on guys i'm all hyped up i so round one is going well you know he's measuring it's a championship fight you know it's five rounds you know we're testing the waters you know um and i know he kind of picks things up slowly so I was like, shoot, I got to I got to hit him hard like this round. So and my thing is, like, I threw right hands a lot. And I, you know, I like doing that. And I caught him with one and I saw him stumble. And uh, so I ran him like, quack, 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 elbow, like try to do this. Um, that was my last that was my little flurry. I think I took that first round. Um, go back in the corner. I knew he was going to come at me. He was a kicker, you know. Big meaty legs, you know what I'm saying? Built like thick. Like he was a short, thick dude, you know? Right. I'm like the tall, skinny guy. So I knew he was like a kicker. And I think I took this one kick in the second round where I kind of like flinched because I thought it was going low, but it went a little higher. And it was a left kick. So it came from this side, is from what I remember. And I just come across like this to block it all awkward. And boom, I turned my thumb over. I felt that shit snap. Oop. You know, my language, it was, so it was my radius and, you know, being a PT, you know, your anatomy, the radius kind of articulates with your whole wrist, the ulna's on the other side. So I always wonder if I hit my ulna, could I finish that fight? But I felt that thing crack. And the only thing holding my, my hand together was that glove. I felt like, whoa, dude. So he goes and I, I try not to show he, I'm hurt, but I'm like, dude. This is round two of a five round fight, you know what I'm saying? And he's picking it up. He must have thrown like two or three more on the same arm. And then I think that he needed it. And I was just like, 
I just felt it like, you know, like something extra. What was that pain like? Well, I've broken my leg. I've like bruised a rib. It was not so much even like, I don't even know how to explain it, but put it this way. Like one more kick, I felt like my arm was going to fly off. Like it was a comminuted fracture, as you know, so it was shattered in that area. And that's why it took a lot longer to heal than normal. Um, it's a net one. It, it, it hurt. There was adrenaline going. And then all these things started going through my head. Like, but uh, I got, I, I'm moving in a week. I get, I'm starting a new job and I kind of need this arm to be a PT. So, man, all this flew in my head in like five short seconds. And I couldn't even like move my arm. So the ref came up to me. He's like, you're going to continue. And it was probably the hardest thing I've ever said because, dude, as a fighter, you know, I'm like a warrior. I've never quit. I've never got knocked out. I've never been TKO. And, and this is like hard to even talk about because like, it made me really question like, dude, was I really ready to give up this arm, you know, to, to just be like, I made it through this fight, like there to just be like, I made it through this fight. Like, was I ready to do that? And, and at that second, it just wasn't worth it to me. You know, it was, it was some, I felt like such a punk man and it sucked, you know, but you know, things happen the way they did, you know? <laughs> so you went through that, that round and you literally can remember a few seconds where you, in your face, you see the, the future of, do I go through this fight? I lose my arm. Of course, as a physical therapist, we work with our patients manually. We're working on them with our hands a lot. And having a bad radius fracture, by the way, for the people out there, you can lose your rotation, your form, your supination, pronation if it's pretty bad. And that could, that could definitely affect you, especially for, for you know, the small little movements that we do as therapists. Let me, let me also give some more backup story, which is even crazier. I had fractured this radius and ulna before when I was a kid. And it was, I don't know, that might have something to do with it. But here's another thing. I took this fight and I didn't have medical insurance because I had quit my job. So that was another thing. I was like, this was the worst situation to be fighting. But out of all, you know, out of all my 20 fights, like 10 smokers, you know, I've been in the ring like over 30 times. I've never gotten hurt. And of course it happened that time. Wow. And you didn't have it was a crazy, crazy situation, man. And, uh, it put me through ups and downs in my head after that. I was immediately went to the ER. They had to do an emergency surgery, put a plate in, um, screws. Uh, you know, meanwhile, you know, I had to move in like a few days, start a new job, had to explain this to my new boss. I'm glad, you know, they kind of were like, well, it is what it is. And so that's what I was dealing with 2017. I had some good friends that helped me move because I, you know, you, you're not supposed to wait bear, um, came out here to the Bay area, uh, that relationship ended up, be, you know, we got engaged that fell through for whatever, uh, you know, reason it wasn't meant to be just fine. And so it was a whole roller coaster. I had to find a new whole identity coming to Cal, coming back to Cali. I thought it was going to be this glamorous return right when I came back, but my, you know, of course life does that to you. Right. Yeah, I, I hear you. And to a lesser extreme in terms of the physical side, but back in 2017, that was my last year with the St. Louis Cardinals. I was there with the Cardinals for three years. And lo and behold, I think you mentioned something about it in the fall of 2017. And that was when my contract ended October 31st, 2017. And just a few short months later with my now fiance, we relocated out to Los Angeles from Florida. And for me, that was a big turning point because all I ever wanted was to be a part of, you know, a major league organization, whether it was a player or a staff member. And I was out there throwing with the guys every day. It was a dream come true. And so like you, I had to refocus and reframe what, what was next for me. And when you're an elite performer and you're going for the, the dreams, it's tough to step away from it in any way, shape or form. So I, I know firsthand for myself, that was a tough challenge. I'm still transitioning from 2017 ever since I was in baseball. I'm still uh, developing my brand outside of it and going straight to the people. 
uh, instead of working for the organization, which I feel better about. So through all of 2017 and your work, what are some of the things that you embody with your care of your patients that you learned firsthand as a fighter? Well, man, you know, I can, I can tell you, I got a cool scar. I can, uh, when I tell patients, like when they say like, Hey, have you been through the ACL or whatever? I'm like, yeah, Ted, check this out. You know, I still got, I still got that going down here. Yeah. 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 So, so they so, came, they came, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So I, I can kind of show them and say, these were the steps I had to take. Listen, it's not going to be a smooth journey. There's going to be ups and downs. I can really explain it to them. It's, it's kind of a cool story. They believe in me more. Um, and it was one of those things where I really, that was the first surgery I had too. So I, 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 you had to kind of take these things and kind of flip them around and, and, and figure out what your real purpose is and, and, you know, still finding that out. But what I do know is that like my passion for being a PT it was like this weird balance where it was like fighter PT, like, like, I feel like now I'm like the healer, you know, it was before it was like the fighter slash the healer, you know, the fighter, you know, how does that even work? And it did work, but like, man, all, all my energy is in helping now. Like I'm, I'm more selfless. I, I don't have to be as selfish. And that really kind of changed the game as a provider. I feel like. You know, and for you yourself, I'm sure you've had more time to heal and recover now that you're not competing as a fighter. And so, how how is that? <laughs> I'll tell you what, man. I don't miss like these fight camps where I was. I'm like starving and doing all this crap. Like I, I'll be honest, I wasn't healthy. You know, there I've overtrained, and when I look back on it, you know, I was getting like, you know, all these crazy like from all the training and you know rashes and all this nasty stuff like going on. Um, like my body is thanking me a little more like fighting at the time. Like you got to really want it. Like you got to want it. I was ready to, you know, before that fight, every fight I went in there knowing that I could die in that ring. You know, I was ready to go there, which is like, why would I think that way? But you know, we all got to go sometimes, but that was the mentality I had, you know? And, um, you had to be ready with that. And, and to put yourself through that, it's kind of a, a crazy mentality, but now I can really be holistic about it and take care of myself. I'm eating more, I'm eating, you know, nutritious stuff. Uh, I, I'm my workout. I'm listening to my body when I work out, which, you know, is the hardest thing as a fighter, like telling myself, like, uh, you know, let's scale back right now and plan this out so that we longevity, you know, so a whole different, like situation, but yeah, a good question to ask, I guess, for somebody like you, who is both a fighter and physical therapist, when your patients ask you the question of, is this too much? When is it too much? Not enough. How do you, how did you learn from your own fighting or did you learn from your own fighting in terms of how you can teach people to kind of figure out how to gauge their activity? Yeah, Absolutely. And, you know, that's a really complicated uh, question. You know, we can get real deep about that. But, you know, one way I look at it is, are you training for a competition? You know, that's one way to really understand where in that, you know, where in the cycles you are. You got the world championship competition. You got Tokyo 2021 coming up like next week. That might change the way how hard you're going to push it, right? Versus if, yeah, versus if it's you know in the distance and you can take rest days and things like right. that. Yeah, and so. it's the cost benefit analysis, and you have to look at it a little bit transactionally and ask yourself: Is throwing a few more fastballs in your bullpen session really necessary? Is it going to pay off for something? And if you're working on a new pitch or something or tweaking a pitch, then maybe the answer is yes. If you're a fighter getting ready for the, the competition or the fight coming up, obviously you're in camp, you're getting ready. But a lot of general ath general population athletes that are not you know, competing at a high level, but for them personally, it means a lot to them. They have a tough time knowing when to push themselves and when, when not to. And I think they, the biggest thing, I think as an athlete, you always look at the bigger picture, right? You're always looking for the gold. You're looking for the, the big picture and how it fits in. And when you're not competing, it's sometimes tough because I feel like at least 
for me, sometimes you don't have a physical or an actual objective goal. A lot of people out there that are weekend warriors, they just do it because they love it, but they don't have goals that they're going through on a yearly basis. So I think having short, medium, and long-term goals is definitely important and, and can help. But you know, I'm sure when your athletes are going through trials and tribulations, you're definitely probably somebody you, that, that they'd want to talk to because you get it. You have that empathy. You could look at them in the eye and be like, you know, I know what you're going through. I feel you. I feel you. I know what you're going through. You know, like I would, I had so many, you know, that, that arm thing wasn't even like the only like bad injury I've had. I've seen some pretty bad ankle issues where I'm pretty sure I must, must have had like grade three or four tears in my ankle and s- still somehow figured ways to train because you don't have to just stop training. You modify, right? You know, if, if, if I injured my wrist on my right hand, you know, I'm not going to go and, and start hitting pads and just throw that right cross over and over man, this is going to be the best jab I'm ever going to have because this is what I'm working on now, you know? Using that as an opportunity. And so that's a big yeah. point of injury to elite. You know, in the book, I, people that are listening loyally to my podcast are hearing a lot about this book. It's coming out in the next few months, I promise you. The, first, the second edit's done. And a big, a big thing I talk about in injury to elite is using a seemingly negative thing, or I call it a time or like in 2017, that was your time zero, you know, and using that to develop something else, right? Like when yeah. you know, baseball, this happened all the time. When the baseball player is on the bench because they're hurt, guess what? You got a lot of time to watch the game and perfect the mental side of it. And, you know, as a, as a fighter, perfecting the other side of your body can be a big thing, especially if that was a weakness of yours. So always looking for the negative, the, the, not just the negative, but looking for the positive in the negative which is which is super empowering i feel like uh, absolutely man you got to draw the good and that's just in life you know like i said 2017 was a lot of crazy things um that happened you know I put my dog down too right after that and it, it's like one thing after another and then i had to kind of like you know think to myself get a little spiritual like why you know why why are all these things happening why you know a little slump going on here and uh, draw out the positives. And if you can extract, you know, some of that and maybe think of things in the long term, like the journey, these are just little lessons and, and, and little bumps, little tests that you got to take. You know, I know that that ain't easy to think about, but yeah. Man. And so that kind of brings me to one of the highlights that I've heard about that you've been up to with the Olympics. And you got that amazing fellowship out there in Colorado at. Uh, the USOC training center. Oh yeah. Like, wow. You know, that was, that was such a crazy experience. I went in, I believe 2000, uh, was it 2016 or 17? I, I went a few, a couple times, you know, they are two week long sports medicine rotations and, you know, they select people based on a hard application and background checks and all that. Um, and they basically bring on a PT, a Cairo, and like an AT, uh, athletic trainer or a massage therapist. And you spend a couple of weeks in the clinic treating athletes that live there. And you also get sent to their practice to cover. So as a PT, that was kind of new to me. I'm learning how to be an ATC, you know. They, they're giving you the whole bag of how to like tape and everything, uh, the whole athletic trainer bag. And, and I learned, yeah. I learned so much. I, I covered like the boxing practice. I was giving, you know, the um, concussion test after every sparring session, which they do. You know, uh, I was going to the wrestling practices, doing skin inspections on the kids for camps, right? Making sure they didn't have anything that was contagious uh, and things that were allowed, you know, you had to cover them up the right way. Let's clap it up for athletic trainers because, uh, I mean, seriously, Dude. Us, us physical therapists, we hide behind you know the the polo shirt tucked into the khakis which i by the way don't wear that anymore i i was done with that a few years ago but we hide behind that and we hide behind the prescription and oh dr smith sent you here the athletic trainers are out there they're on the field the player comes out there with a broken leg and the athletic trainer is the one the one handling it not the surgeon yeah. not us 9 times out of 10 and then 
people like you and I that are lucky enough to see the value in that, you know, a lot of our colleagues kind of probably I'm not calling anybody out, but <laughs> they probably feel that athletic training might be beneath them. And, and I don't, and I think that's, I do, I do not think that at all. But for me, when I worked with athletic trainers, I'm like, yeah. whoa, this is actually, whoa. this is sports medicine. Like the skin, the, oh the head God. injury assessments, that's stuff that we don't see in the clinic. Now, you know, when you give an injury to a physical, you give the rehab process to a physical therapist, we're really good at breaking it down to steps and a science and, and all that great stuff. But in terms of the triage and the post-injury stuff, which is really important, athletic trainers are so undervalued. I'll say it. I mean, they are. They're undervalued. Dude, when I, at the Olympic Training Center, mad respect for everyone there. And you, if you went in that clinic, you wouldn't know who's a physical therapist, who's an athletic trainer, and who's a chiropractor. And, you know, this, I'm glad, Rob, thank you for bringing that up. Because when I was working for the Cardinals, one of the things I did was I scheduled flights. I scheduled flights for players. And at the time, I was saying to myself, this is Ego Dave out of SS, my first year with the Cardinals. And the farm director says, Dave, you're going to make these flights for the players through our system to get them to the doc, see the doctor or the team doctor, come to Jupiter and rehab with you and all that stuff. And so I'm like, wait, so I'm the bus driver, I'm the lunch person and I'm the physical therapist too. Like <laughs> heck is going on? But you know what? Athletic trainers do that stuff. I mean, athletic trainers back in the in the day when sports medicine was not even a thing, they were pretty much like the father, the mother, the the bus driver sometimes. They took care of everything. And this is not to say that they're blue collar and they don't understand the science. They do. And so this is why for me personally, I'm going on a little soapbox here. You know what? Yeah. The whole arguments about athletic trainers shouldn't bill out for these services. Well, let me ask you this for these physical th for these physical therapists out there that don't think that. If an athletic trainer is able to hold someone's head after a cervical spine injury, right? Yeah. Can't they bill out to do a little ankle PRE exercise of <laughs> eversion version? Right. And for me personally, I think there's plenty of patience to go along for all of us. But I think it's so important for us to come together with the other practitioners. The chiros too. Not every chiropractor is evil. There's plenty yeah. of chiropractors that don't manipulate joints. Yeah. There's, there's some chiropractors that are more strength coaches than, than manipulators. One of my good friends included. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. And so I didn't mean for this to, to get towards that. But since you had that experience with the, the USOC and I was up in Lake Platte, yeah was with HSS, I learned, I saw that too. Like, it doesn't matter. PT, Cairo, like you're in the trenches and I don't know about you, but that's, that's the part that I, that I miss. That's the part. Uh, I miss. Dude, you, you saw, you, you saw it at, at, a, at the high, highest levels too. And, um, you know, there's so much to be learned from everybody. And if we can all come together as a team, you know, it's, it's not really anyone's fault. Like maybe it's the insurance companies or something that we need to really blame, but you know, everybody's got their own skills and expertise and there's, there is a lot of crossover and people get territorial, but I've worked with along, I worked in wellness clinics with Kairos, like some of my good friends, you know, in New York city are Kairos too. I learned so much from them. And, um, man, it, if a patient came to me and they told me they're seeing one, I want to get mad. I'm like, Hey, if that's what it takes and they're doing something I'm not doing, it's not about me. It's about you. Like, that's your that's your back that's not mine take care of yourself we maybe i can add a piece to this puzzle like let's right. all come together and figure it out like it doesn't have to be one way absolutely so not to jump the gun and turn not to change directions too quickly but amidst all the recent changes with covid how are you continuing to grow your brand now that you know you're you, like you were said you're getting much more into the sports performance side as you've kind of retired from fighting yeah, yeah. It's given me so much time to really like build up my other set of skills that I feel like is more of like a longevity for me. You know, I, I, I knew I could only fight so long anyways, but this is really allowing me to take that all that experience I just talked about and kind of give it out there. Like I feel like me and you, we have something different and and special that we can really help people with. So, you know, during this time, I, I was furloughed for a little bit. 
got I work in a few days. We're trying to build that up with telehealth, but I've always been a sports, you know, kind of performance coach. I've had clients on the side outside of work and that really gets me passionate. Like when you see my fitness class, I teach fitness classes uh, out in Alameda. Um, shout out Island Pilates. They put me on and let me teach a few classes and let me do my thing because they trusted me. Um, I'll be back to that. <laughs> but right now is the time I'm trying to do this online thing because it's allowing me to have a platform on Zoom to create classes and a community for people that need it. We're not seeing people, you know, we're stuck in a home. We're not moving around. So I've been putting together um, little Zoom classes that focus on the three things that I'm into. You know, I have a mobility rehab type class that I teach. I do a strength and conditioning, you know, we're CSCS, like, you know, when you come to my workouts, man, these are like my fight training workouts. You know, sure. this is what I do to supplement my pad work and everything. Nice. And things that I've seen with elite athletes and figured out not just, oh, that looks cool on Instagram, but I know where this fits in the piece, in the puzzle kind of thing. Right. And, and then I do a Muay Thai class. You know, a lot of my fighters and newcomers come in and I teach them the basics. It's, I'm, it's, I'm in when's the next one i'm writing it down oh yeah friday 4 p.m pacific 7 p.m eastern time is muay thai i just finished my strength and conditioning today it was a lot of fun my buddy even had uh you know from new we have people from new york people in hawaii east west coast so friday's muay thai and then saturday um is gonna be my uh i call it recover and reform nice and that's that's because it, I use a reformer, a Pilates reformer in the actual class. Oh, so, cool. but I, you know, I do foam rolling. I show myofascial release. I show mobility. Nice. And that's Saturday at 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Hop time. in there, man. You're welcome to come. It's free slash donation. But I always tell people like, don't even worry about it. Come in here, enjoy the positivity. I'm always cracking jokes. You know how I am. So. That's really what it is. So how can people find you out there out uh, listening to the podcast if they want to sign up? Yeah, man. I'm over here on Instagram. That's probably where I am the most active. It's at the underscore Rob underscore Lynn technique. The Rob Lynn technique. (laughs) Going up on the uh, show notes when we post this episode up. Listen, Rob, I, I think your story is unbelievable. To be an elite level athlete, while in physical therapy school, because I, you know, I've had people on the show before that are PT students that played baseball in college, not while in PT school. So what right. you do is amazing. I think a lot of, I mean, any patient that works with you is is absolutely blessed because you're somebody that really can understand to a higher level than a lot of us out there what it's like to really be injured and and to go from injured to elite. I'll throw that in there, uh, and so. <laughs> I look forward to doing a webinar with you on maybe our collaboration of the mind, body, spirit in terms of whether you're a fighter or a baseball player, any type of elite athlete, how our experience in the the elite sports performance world can be empowering for you guys and girls out there that are going through your own little injuries and also just getting better, getting better at everything and, and especially in the physical side. So We'll uh, we'll keep everybody in tune with that. I'll I'll definitely be posting a lot of this up there. This is my first recorded Joe Rogan esque podcast, and what better way to do that than with a Muay Thai fighter? <laughs> <laughs> you know that's going to be a dope webinar. You have so much to say on that topic, um, and that is the X factor, man, for these athletes. As you know, that is the X factor because you know at that level. You know, physical abilities take you so far. It's what's up here. It's what's in here that really counts. And that'll take you That'll take you further than the baseball field. That'll take you further than the ring. It's bigger than that, guys. I, I, I don't, and I don't want to step on toes right here, Rob, but you were a three-time world champion. How do you feel about when it's something like the, the, you know, the 3X or 3X performance? What do you think about that for the webinar? Oh, as as uh, <laughs> three times, baby, bring it back. Three I, times. 
the you know the three the three things that that you need to do right now to get to that elite status you want to be, and that's mind, body, spirit. And so we can share all that kind of stuff with. I love it. Nice, awesome. Well, Rob, blessed to connect with you again uh, since we've. I mean, shit, it's been too long, but. I'm I'm really excited for you. It seems like you're in a great place right now. You're really taking advantage of the virtual online thing and you are like me. You go for it. And I love that about you, man. You're going for it. And look, for everybody out there, keep going for it. Your job's not guaranteed. Nothing's guaranteed. The only thing that's guaranteed is basically what you decide to do. And it's a choice. You either choose not to do what you love and not to pursue your passion right? Or you do it. And in my opinion, life's not worth living if you're not going to go after it. So let's all get after it. Let's continue sticking through this tough times, but you know, things like this make it all, all worthwhile and sharing these amazing stories. So Rob, thank you. Dude, thank you for having me, man. Great connecting, man. This is just the beginning for you, man. I appreciate it, man. We'll stay in touch and hey man, maybe uh, one day we'll, we'll do a podcast of your own or something like that. Dope, man. Thank you.